you know me, um, I was I was the director of media for about uh, eight, nine years for the annual conference, put all the stuff on the screens, and the irony of this presentation <laughs> is that it's analog. I ran out of TVs, <laughs> so I had no more ability to do digital display. So uh, it can be done analog, it's okay. Um, so I want to start with a word of prayer and then uh, we'll dive into this. Gracious and amazing God, thank you for uh, this afternoon, for these people who are excited about vision, about helping people see the future of your church and helping make decisions for programs and activities and, well, Lord, vision. I pray that uh, you'll speak through my words, uh, you will speak through our minds, our thoughts, and our hearts so that we, in turn, can speak to our congregations and give them the hope, give them the direction, give them your vision and guidance for an awesome, transformative future together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, vision casting. Uh, I'm just curious, how many people have been to a vision casting presentation before, communicating vision? A couple of people. How many people have read something on vision? Everybody, okay. Uh, it's like the watchword today. It is the thing that people talk about. And yet the irony is we keep going back to it. We keep going back to vision, asking people to learn more about it and talk about it more. And I did not realize why. Why is this such a big watchword? Like uh, some people have been trained to death on this topic and they've heard training after training. And why do we continually go back to it? And I think it's because we know what we need to do. We know how to cast vision, but we're kind of scared sometimes to do it because we're worried, what will the congregation think? We're worried, what authority are we usurping from the leaders, right? There's all these leaders, these church council, staff parish, trustees, all the leaders of the church who are to be making decisions. And so sometimes we timidly, whether you are a lay person or a clergy person, makes no difference, we will timidly sit back and let somebody else lead the way. That, that seems to have been what I've observed. And so many times, as I've sat with people uh, talking about a vision that they have on their heart, I have heard from people the clear vision this is exactly what they know that they're supposed to do. And they said, but my church, I, we didn't go that way. We, we didn't do that because, well, I just didn't speak up and, and I just, I couldn't tell them. And I, I just, I want to be in that room with people and say, listen to them. They know what they're doing. They, they know exactly where you're going and they know what it looks like. And if you just give them the mic for a moment, you're going to see and hear something amazing. If only you would give them that opportunity. Um, vision casting is not hard, and yet it is. It's salesmanship. Uh, it's selling something to people. That, that's really what leadership comes down to. And how well we can sell it will determine how well we're able to lead. Uh, when I came here to Trinity, and this is where I want to start, uh, I had a beautiful gift given to me. Uh, my predecessor, who happens to be in the room, Tom Maurer, uh, Tom had been here for about four or five years. Three. Three only? Oh, look, look at that. Three and three. Uh, Tom had been here for three years and um, it made some very necessary changes for us as a church. Uh, very important changes, helped write the budget, helped write the ship, really made some hard calls and, and some difficult changes and went to the bishop and said, Bishop, I'm ready to retire. It is a blank slate. Send somebody in to just do something cool, right? That's, that, was, that was my marching orders, which was such a gift, right? So I came in and I did some listening, and the first thing that I noticed, the very, very first night that I was introduced here at Trinity, was our sanctuary. And uh, you see our sanctuary on the tables in front of you. Uh, that looks a little bit different from the sanctuary that you see here this afternoon. In fact, a couple of people were taking pictures of our sanctuary. It looks so different. Um, I learned uh, just in the last year that back when Trinity was built in 1911, there was a sanctuary salesman who went around uh, our conference and had four or five models. And your church was to pick from a model, what do you want your sanctuary to look like, what do you want your church to look like, and that's what you got. 
That's why so many of our churches look the same. And so we had this wonderful uh, choir area up front where the choir faced each other and they sang into each other during worship and they're flanked by the organ so the choir is then drowned out by the organ. It's wonderful. Uh, we had the, the pulpit and the lectern and the vanity rails you see there so that nobody really sees you. You are raised up on high, completely separated from the congregation. That was, that was the goal back then. You are too holy for us to, to be down with the people. And uh, then if, if you look right in the middle, and, and this is the part that struck me the very first night that I toured the sanctuary, there's these gold stripes right on the middle steps. Do you see those in the picture? And they're the bullnose transition strips that protect carpeting. And uh, they were to hold the carpeting down on the stairs so that people didn't trip, so that you'd see them. So, you know, they, they shone during worship. They were god-awful ugly, I'm sorry. And um, they became a trip hazard, actually. Uh, the choir did not enjoy necessarily singing on the stairs because uh, if you're not so good on your feet, it was easy to trip, and down you would go. The other amazing thing that I, I found out in my first few weeks at Trinity is we have two traditional services at 8 and 11, and then we have a contemporary service smack dab in the middle. Now tell me, where are you going to put a 20-piece, yes, you heard me right, a 20-piece band yes, on that altar area? <laughs> yeah, you're not. Um, what happened was the horn line would be up top uh, in the, the middle of the little chancel area that we had there, and then between the front pew and the vanity rail, kind of behind the prayer rail and in front of the prayer rail and spilling over everywhere was the rest of the band and the singers. It was a disaster every week. Now, it wasn't a disaster to anybody who was here because they had kind of grown into it. When the service was launched, this was normal. But coming with outside eyes, I saw these things very fresh. They, they were glaring at me. It made worship difficult. It made transitions difficult. Uh, the whole presentation was less than it could be. And, it gets better, Trinity has an amazing bell choir. We have a great bell choir. In fact, we have five octaves, is it five wow. octaves of bells? Which is a lot of tables. And so when the bells would play, they would set up tables right in front of the front row of the pews. Now when the band comes up at 9.30 to play, they're now stuck between the table and the pew. They got three feet. God help us if there's a fire, we are doomed, right? Everybody's going down in flames. This was a problem. And very quickly, because I had been given a blank slate, because I had sat in and listened to people, I learned that there had been a dream once that we could redo our sanctuary. We had a plan of having this great open flat space and, and the band could be raised up in the altar area and, and it would be just a really cool thing. And we weren't sure how we wanted to do that, but we thought maybe this could work. That plan was created in 1998. It was 2015 when I arrived here. So a vision had sat on the shelf for almost 20 years. Now there's lots of reasons. Some of it was finances, some of it was timing, some of it was pastoral leadership, some of it was lay leadership. Lots of different reasons that it never got off the ground. But the vision was here. And all we needed to do was execute it. Now, Tom had set me up really, really well. Trinity had had a lot of debt back in the day. And uh, working with the leadership, the council, and everyone, they, they righted their budget and started paying down the debt. And by November, the first year I was here, we were blessed to be able to pay off a debt that had been around for almost 20 years. It was awesome. Now we had momentum, right? You don't want to lose that. Mm -hmm. You got momentum, do something with it, right? And so what we did was we said, well, let's come up with a plan for the sanctuary. And fortunately, I didn't have to go far. The plan was already there. All I had to do was a little bit of homework. I had a few conversations with people. I said, well, what would it look like? I talked to a couple of contractors, a lighting guy, a sound guy. We talked to a, 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 yep. mm -hmm. a woodworker. 
uh, we had all sorts of people kind of involved in this, and, and just some people that we had met along the way, the trustees had known, and, and we brought all of these teams together, and we said, what would it look like if we created a nice, wide open space, a nice flat platform where worship could happen, and well, we don't want it to always be traditional, so what if we took the pulpit somehow and, and put it on wheels or something, right, so that it could move around when it's not needed, it could move off, and when it's needed, we could bring it out. Uh, what if our organ, how many churches have organs? Okay, a couple of you. Uh, what if our organ could kind of be pushed to the side when we don't need it and brought out when we do? Oh, and by the way, it had never been repaired. It had never had a full upgrade since 1967. 67, so almost 50 years that it was, it was now in need for some facelift. So, and it was down in a pit. And it was in a pit. Um, you can't really see the organ in that picture because the organ and the organist are hidden by that vanity rail. Like, it's great. You, the, the winning sanctuary. I'm, I'm telling you, this is what we live in, right? And so we said, well, what if this is what it would look like? And for the technical people, we came up with four plans, right? Not this guy. But I knew it was important to people. So we had floor plans, and we had pictures for people that don't read floor plans, right? And then we started to talk to their values. And we said, well, how are we going to convince somebody who goes to 930 and who doesn't care about an organ, how are we going to convince them that we need to invest $120,000 in one instrument when they've got 20 instrumentalists up front every week? How are we going to do that? And how? How are we going to convince the, nine, the, the 8 and 11 people that they need to have a wide open worship space, they need to go to all this expense of changing the space to the tune of about $100,000 so that the band at 930 can play, right? How am I supposed to allow them to see the benefits to each other? And the more we talked, the more we realized, well, you know, with this open space, we're we're still able to keep it looking traditional. We're, we're, in fact, able to hide the wires in the floor because we have floor pockets. Mm -hmm. So now, traditional people, you don't have to worry about that rat's nest of wires that have been driving you nuts over in the corner. They're all tucked away, and you'll never see them from week to week. And, and contemporary people, hey, pony up for the organ because look what you're getting. Right? <laughs> right? Your, your band's going to be able to play, and we're going to be able to do cool lighting in the sanctuary, uh, we're going to be able to light up the colors. They can be liturgical as needed, or they can be a little more contemporary as desired. We can do productions at Christmas and at Easter so that we can feature the kids and we can put a spotlight on little Johnny singing like a star on Twilight Night. I don't know. Right? That, that's what we talked about. And we told Grandma how amazing this experience would be for her grandson. Right? We were casting vision about how it can be done. And, and then for the detail-oriented people who wanted to know how much is it going to cost and how long is it going to take, we're going to do it in one week. In fact, we ripped out the sanctuary on a Sunday, and it was done by Saturday for a wedding. <laughs> that was the plan. And everything was in place to execute it. And we had the budget, and we had the fundraising. We had fundraising dinners. We had consults with, with large donors, and we made sure that it would happen. And within the course of a year, after having spent years and years of a vision on the shelf, and years and years of debt, we were able to do what turned out to be a $275,000 remodel with cash on hand. It all comes down to vision and how we communicate. Now that's not unique to Trinity, right? Every church can do this. But we sit back with this vision on our hearts. And we're like, why? Why, why, can't, I, why can't I tell them that? And I think it's because somewhere along the line, uh, we lose our gumption. And then the other half, we lose the outline. It's just like writing a sermon. There's some basic parts to a vision that we need to have if we're going to communicate it well. And so that's what I want to give you here this morning. And uh, the first place, actually, that, that you'll see on your notes, and this is, um, this is important to understand, a vision 
is a lot about adaptive thinking. Have you heard of adaptive thinking before? Maybe, kind of, a couple people. Adaptive thinking, pretty popular in, in leadership and in thought circles today. This is kind of the, the, the leading wave, the leading edge. Uh, there's two types of thinking that we have in our world. There's adaptive thinking and there's functional thinking. Functional thinking says, I have a task to complete, that's what I'm gonna do. Functional thinking says, A to B, there better not be a C in between because I'm not sure how to get over it, right? We have a job to do, a task-oriented, that's what we're gonna do. Adaptive thinking, on the other hand, it is much more, without sounding like a heretic, much more evolutionary, right? <laughs> Adaptive thinking is almost a survival of the fittest. It's the ability to intelligently modify, that's another word for adapt. Mm -hmm. It's the ability to intelligently modify our behavior in response to the changing needs of a problem-solving situation. In other words, it's very vision casting driven, right? Adaptive thinking looks at the problem and says, okay, how are we gonna get through this? And the speed bumps that we see along the way, how are we gonna address them? Sometimes the speed bumps are the people that we need to communicate the vision to, and other times the speed bumps are part of the problem, part of the project that we are trying to work on. So this is what vision casting, this is what vision communicating is gonna be all about. Pause here. Any questions? You guys are making this too easy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So communicating a vision. Um, one of the things that a vision needs to have, there's four C's that we're going to go through. Maybe you've heard of them before. There's some really great books out there that we'll talk about vision. Uh, Andy Stanley, um, Vision Casting, or Visioneering. Visioneering. It's got another one, though. Making Vision Stick. That's what it is. Uh, see, he all, he's all about the vision. Um, and I'm an Andy Stanley stalker, I'll be honest. Um, but there, there's all of these vision, vision books out there. It, some of these C's are taken from there and elsewhere. Um, first and foremost, the vision must be clear, right? <laughs> It has to be a clear vision. If it is not clear in your head, if you do not see the vision yourself, there is no way that anybody else is possibly going to see it, right? And sometimes we like to have groupthink. Uh, we like to have consensus built. And we like to move as a herd in one direction. It's safer inside the herd, right? You're not outside. You're not on, the, on your own. You're not going to take the bullets out front. But we as leaders, we're designed to go first. <laughs> we're designed to wear the flak jacket and to take the bullets. It does not matter whether you are clergy or lay. And that means we need to shape this clear vision in our heads and, and we need to be able to, to communicate with somebody else, to, to know this is where I'm going. A lot of times when we talk about vision, we talk about nebulousness, mm -hmm. right? I've got an idea that, that it'll be this space and it'll be good for people of all ages. It's great. That's an idea. That's not a vision, right? I've got this idea that we're going to do this program, and it's going to be for kids. That's great. <laughs> That's the starting. Uh, a vision has to be clear. You've got to work out the details. Help people understand what you're talking about here. You want to make sure that... Um... Oh, that was not you want to make sure that it's a crystal clear vision statement so that when people, when people read this, your vision is going to come in many different forms, whether it's the vision for the church or the vision for a project. You want to make sure that you eliminate as much ambiguity as possible, right? So people know the direction that you're headed, so that they don't reinterpret the vision in a way very contrary to what you meant. So you want to try to clear up all the questions. So you want to sit with your vision statement. You want to sit with your, your vision for a project and try to figure out, okay, what, what could other people see in this? How could other people take this and, and understand it and run with it? Are they going to get the same result that I'm intending them to have? So we want to make sure that it's very clear in our heads. You, you have the Andy Stanley quote there from Making Vision Stick. Uh, if you haven't defined the problem, determined a solution, and discovered a compelling reason why, now is the time to act. You aren't ready to go public with your vision. It won't stick. In other words, if it's not clear in your head, 
If you find yourself explaining it to the first few leaders and you're like, uh, 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 you're not ready. Hmm. And that's good. Pause there, right? Pause there. Pull it back. You're not ready to go out. Make it clear to yourself. Work with some other people to clarify it. Have them ask you the questions, right? What should I do? How can we improve this? How can we make this clearer for others? This vision project that, that we were doing for the sanctuary, we sat with this in council. We sat with this in trustees. We looked at it from a bunch of different angles. Uh, we brought in the contractors, and we laid it out with them, and we asked them to give us feedback on it. We tried to clarify it from every angle that we possibly could. Clarity matters. Another component to the clarity, and this is going to help you later on down the road as you're trying to sell this, how is this vision going to help us accomplish our mission? Right? Answer that question with clarity. As United Methodists, we know our mission broadly, if your church has adopted it, is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Yes. So how is this vision going to help us accomplish that? When we looked at our sanctuary, we said, well, this new space is going to allow us to reach more people. It's going to allow us to improve our worship experience. It's going to allow us to give people a, a more transcendental experience of worship. It's going to allow us to incorporate more people on bells, more people in the band. Our worship leader, he, did you notice that our worship band has 20 people? Did you catch that? My last church, our band had four. Some days it only had three, and some days it only had one. <laughs> right? I think that's most bands. Most bands are five at most, right? We have 20 and sometimes more. Because our worship leader has a philosophy for worship that he wants to include anyone who wants to help lead in worship. In fact, along the way, he had a woman who was learning the guitar, and all she could do was play a G chord. And so she got up there on the platform with the band, and she counted out her rests until it came to a G, and she strummed her G, and she stood there. <laughs> yes. Right? Wonderful. And we said, you know what? We're going to be able to put more Gs up on the pulpit. <laughs> That's the goal. We want to include more people in worship. That's great. That's the goal. How are we going to make disciples? How are we going to include people? In this? Questions about clarity. Our vision also needs to be concise. Keep it simple. Yeah, keep it simple, stupid. Great. Right. Yeah, you know, that phrase. Is that for the stupid people? Like, is that why they include stupid on the back end? I feel like that's talking to me. I'm not sure. It says, keep it simple, comma. Stupid. OK, so it is to me, the stupid people. I got you. Right? We, we want to keep it simple. If it becomes too detailed, too complicated, people are going to get lost, right? Um, any of you who do any speaking in worship, teaching in a class, uh, anytime when you're trying to read people, you know that glazed over look that you get? It's about five minutes into your sermon, and you're like, oh, where did we start over? <laughs> You've just gone too complicated, right? It, it got too long-winded. They, they didn't follow you. Keep it concise. Keep it simple. Allow them to get the idea, but don't work out all the details for them. Mm. Work out the big details that need worked out, right? We're going to do this in a week. It's going to be okay. It is not going to interrupt worship. That's the big detail people wanted to know. It's not going to interrupt worship. Well, how are you going to do that? I don't know yet. That's our contractor's problem, not mine. <laughs> right? Keep it concise. That's okay. Now, the other reason that you want to keep it concise is so that they can also communicate it to others. Right? You can rehearse your vision. Um, rehearse it in 30 seconds, 5 minutes, and 20 minutes. Right? Have three different speeches, three different presentations of your vision. You've got the elevator talk for when you're in the hospital and you're going to visit so-and-so and you run into somebody in the elevator, right? Tell me about what's going on. 30 seconds, that's all you got, unless you've got a really slow elevator. <laughs> if you happen to see somebody who wants to talk a little bit more, maybe they've got a little bit more time, they, they go for coffee with you for a short bit, you want to give them the five minutes. Right? It's, it's not going to drown them in details. 
but it's gonna give them a little bit more detail. It's gonna whet their appetite. I have a friend of mine, um, I, I did another project before this one. Uh, we were working on a coffee house, and a friend of mine had been away from the church for 10 years, and I invited him to coffee. And my goal, I flat out had a goal in this conversation, I wanted to get him on helping us work on the coffee house. Mm. Like, that was my goal, to get him back to church. And so we went and we had coffee, and I said, hey, Chad, I want to tell you about this new project that I'm working on. And we only talked for three, four minutes, mm. right? That's, that's all, and then, how's your life? And then he came back to it at the very end of the conversation. So, so tell me more about this coffee house. I, I really want to know more, right? It was enough to whet his appetite, enough to make him curious, to dive back in. That's the goal of the five minutes, is to get them curious enough to ask more questions. And then have the 20 minute presentation. The 20 minute presentation are gonna be for the people who have the real questions, and also for the people that wanna make a real investment. You need people, you need money to make your vision happen, right? So if I'm gonna give you $10,000, you better have $10,000 worth of answers for me, right? That's not going to happen in 30 seconds. It can happen in 20 minutes. You can touch on my passion. You can clear up some of the big questions that I have. And you can make me sufficiently confident that you know what you're doing. But my time's important because I'm going to give you $10,000. My time is valuable. I can't give you much more than 20 minutes, OK? So we've got the 30 seconds. We've got the five minutes, and we've got the 20 minutes. And our goal at the end of this is that your congregation, your people, your key leaders that do all the talking through the church can re-communicate it in those little segments, right? They're not gonna remember the 20 minutes maybe because they don't have the same passion that you do for it. But they're gonna have that 30 seconds and they might even have the five minutes. And I know in this church, the 10 people to talk to and every single person will know about it, right? <laughs> You have them in your church, too. Uh, sometimes it's only one or two people, and they'll make sure the whole church knows what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. If you teach them that 30 seconds or that five minutes, you don't have to do any more communicating. It's great. It's wonderful. Okay? So keep it clear. Keep it concise. Questions here? So uh, my question is, how do you... How do you cut everything down to make sure that, that, that you have exactly what you need? What's the, what's the pertinent points that, that need to be communicated in those 30 seconds, five minutes? In the, in the, in the, in those that's, a, that's a really great question, Paul. Um, it may be different depending on who you're talking to, right? Uh, you may have one 30 second, in, in my instance, you may have one 30 second presentation for a traditionalist okay. and another 30 second presentation mm -hmm. for a contemporary worshiper, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Because what's their biggest concern? That's what you want to hit there. If you're doing a children's ministry of some sort, right, you've got one 30-second presentation for people with kids, one for people with grandkids, right, and one for people that really don't care about kids, right? Don't have kids, don't want kids, had them one time and just, ugh, right? you, you got to have another presentation for that one. So yeah, you, you may have a couple different ones depending on who you're talking to. <clears throat> it's gotta be clear, it's gotta be concise, and it's gotta be <coughs> concrete. Now this concrete reinforces the clarity, right? But this is where the details, this is, this is where the, the written down, the pictures, the floor plan, this is where all of this comes together. And I think this is the part where we most often as leaders kind of fall short. We don't come up with the plan. This is what sets it out as being different, is when we can put it in writing for people. We can put it before them in a way that they can understand, that they can digest at their own pace, and we give them the details that they need. This is where the leadership vacuum mm -hmm. sucks up the vision, mm -hmm. right? When we're trying to lead as a herd, nobody takes point, nobody takes the plan, nobody writes it up, because, oh, well, the chair will do that, and the chair's thinking, oh, well, so-and-so is gonna do that, and, and it doesn't happen. 
This is where you have the opportunity to excel. In your plan, one of the greatest things that you can do, especially if you are uh, any kind of spiritual leader, if you're a lay leader or you're a clergy person, is rooted in scripture. Root it in scripture. This was one of the things, uh, part of this presentation comes out of uh, some talks we had with Mike Slaughter. Um, I had the opportunity to study with Mike and Adam Hamilton as part of Young Clergy, uh, Young Pastors Network. And um, Mike, whenever he does a presentation, he talks about scripture all the time. All the time. Every point is there. And uh, when it came to presenting the sanctuary to the congregation, I actually took the opportunity, and this is, <laughs> this is a future point, um, I took the opportunity to talk about it on a Sunday morning, and we talked about Solomon's temple, right? Uh, uh, the plan that God had for how he was going to build the temple. Yes. Yeah? Like that. Yeah. <laughs> and we talked about why they would include these details in the temple yes. and where they would get all the materials and how they would build it. And God lays out all the blueprints. And I said, look, this is what we're doing. And look, God did this so that we'd have a holy space where we could worship him and we could worship him in, in creative ways, in God-inspiring ways, right? Ways that we feel inspired by God. And we translated that for people. We rooted it in a scripture passage, so now they felt the divine connection. Um, there, there's other ways, other passages that you can root it in. Um, you know, maybe you've got a passage from Romans that you, you absolutely love. Um, maybe you're doing like a, a community outreach to, to uh, addicts of some sort, and uh, your passage is from Romans 8. Nothing can ever separate us from the love of God. Right? Neither life nor death, neither angels nor demons, our fears for today nor our worries for to get tomorrow. Nothing can ever separate us from the love of God as found in Jesus Christ. So, what passage of scripture can you tie to this to root this and help people own it? Uh, if you're a preacher, and if you're not a lectionary preacher, if you're a thematic preacher, you probably have a lot of practice on this. If you don't have that sort of practice, you still have amazing tools. Um, there's this little thing, maybe you've heard of it, it's called Google. <laughs> right? I can't tell you how much I Google asking for scriptures. It's, it's a brilliant tool. Like, I, I wish that was around when I was in seminary. Like, that would have made it so much easier. Right? Give me a passage about. Boom. You'll get 10 bad passages, but you'll find that one. Yes, sir. Right? <laughs> so, rooted in scripture. Use pictures. Not everybody is an auditory learner, right? Not everybody will listen to you talk. Some people just want to see the pictures. They see the picture books. Uh, the kids have the Action Bible. Anybody familiar with the Action Bible? Right? I got that for my boys. We now give that here for our first graders uh, when they get their first Bibles because of the pictures. It makes the Bible exciting. We've got adults who came to me during a Bible series, and they want an action Bible. <laughs> pictures. People don't always want to read. Show them some pictures. If that means going out, and um, we actually consulted. Uh, we had a, a, a designer, an interior designer, who created this picture for us. Um, there are people throughout the conference who are amazingly gifted and talented. You've got students, I'm sure, in your own congregation who are learning in Adobe and other uh, presentation platforms, uh, you'd be amazed what you can do in PowerPoint, right? Just in a simple PowerPoint presentation, you can take a couple of pictures, slice them together, and, and come up with something amazing. If you give people a picture, you're going to improve their ability to understand your vision, to see it in their head. Ah, that's a good one. Preach it. Mm. Back in the day, it was called the bully pulpit for a reason. <laughs> in some churches, it still is, right? You, if you are a pastor in this room, or if you are a lay speaker in this room, you have the ability to have, in most churches, up to an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not all sermon time. But it is all the ability to vision cast in front of people. 
Every aspect of worship can be about this plan. If you're talking about kids, maybe you sing Jesus Loves Me that Sunday, yes, sir. right? Uh, maybe if you're talking about um, you're talking about single moms, you go to Skit Guys and you download a video on single parents and you show that video as an aspect of worship. Maybe you choose, rooted in scripture, to make your scripture passage the passage of the morning. Even though it's Christmas or Advent and it does not seem to fit, it does not matter. Please don't do a vision casting time then. That's probably not good. But if you do, <laughs> then you're stuck there. <laughs> Include the scripture. Christmas Eve. And don't miss the opportunity during the offering talk. Right? Your giving means so much. You have the ability to transform lives here. Your gift is going to help offset our expenses for this project. You're putting Bibles in the hands of children. But whatever it is, whatever it is that your vision is, help them understand during the offering how they're changing lives. And then wrap it up. You get this great thing at the end called a benediction. Right? That's a parting shot. <laughs> it gives you the opportunity to reinforce what you want them to understand. Sometimes it's just as simple as may you go out and love each other, <laughs> right? That, that was the whole vision of the morning. And other times, may you go out inspired by the space that God has for us, by this space God has carved out for us, that we can worship together. And next week, may you bring others to an experience of Christ Jesus along with us. Go in peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Boom. You got the opportunity to preach it in every aspect of of worship. Art stories. Newsletter stories. Now I'll be honest here, I am supremely blessed here at Trinity supremely blessed beyond my wildest imaginations and in fact in this room and she will kill me later today uh, is this amazing woman named Karen Karen is here by the door turning ten shades of red and Karen is our communications director and every month she produces this amazing newsletter it is eight to twelve pages depending on the month depending on the pictures that we include in it uh, but she runs around sometimes with her cell phone, sometimes with a camera, and she's taking shots of worship. She's Aww. taking shots of babies being baptized and kids being confirmed. And she is telling the story every month in the newsletter. And when our staff and when our volunteer leaders write newsletter articles, I don't want to hear an invitation to a picnic, mm -hmm. right? I don't want to hear, come out to Borough Park at 5 o'clock where we're going to have potato salad. I don't care, right? I want to hear a story. Tell me about Hazel playing bingo last year and being so excited that she won and it just made her day. Tell me about the little boys who were so excited to be able to put the ball in the cup that they won the glass cups and mugs with the Trinity logo on them and they are just looking forward to this year's picnic. Tell me a story about a person. We have these great opportunities to tell stories, and people resonate with stories so much better than just an announcement. Use your newsletter to tell a story, whether it is in pictures or in words, and use these stories to reinforce the vision. Make it part of your plan. And then finally, help them see their future. Help them see their future. My mentor, when I was coming through the candidacy process, was a man named Mike Brosman. Anybody knows Mike Brosman in the room? Mike Brosman is a force to be reckoned with. And Mike was at one time serving a church that was going on through a building project. They were building a new church just kind of down the street. And uh, he had a lot of momentum. 
He had done it well. He had made the plan. He had communicated it with everybody. And one Sunday after worship, there was a little old lady, not all that old. I mean, she, she was uh, late 60s, hey. right? <laughs> like I said, I'm not all that old. Not all that old. And she sat there after worship towards the back in the same pew that she always sits in. And he knew that she was a cantankerous woman when it came to this new vision project, project and the new sanctuary. And he took the opportunity that morning to have a conversation that was crucial and potentially dangerous. But he put himself out there to take a shot, right? And Mike had a conversation with her. Hey, what's going on? Well, you know, Pastor, I, I'm sitting here and, and I just... I'm not sure that I can move to the new sanctuary. I'm not sure that it's not it's gonna be the same. Well, what what's going on? You know, we're we're all gonna move. It's I think they're two weeks from moving, three weeks. You know, it's it's almost done. We're we're gonna head down, it's gonna be great. But Pastor, this stained glass window was donated in honor of my brother when he was killed in the war in Vietnam. And I just don't know that I can do worship without him. See, to her, in her mind and in her heart, she was worshiping with family every week because of that stained glass window. And he realized in that moment how important the different elements in the worship space were. And so he started asking around the church, who donated the cross? Who donated the candles? Who donated this? Who donated that? And he asked as many people as he could to have their family members carry the elements of worship into the new worship space that Sunday. He told them ahead of time, this is what we're going to do. This is how it's going to go. And all of a sudden, they could see themselves now in that space. Whereas before, it was so different. It was such a different change that it just felt wrong to them. Now, it was part of their family. They had ownership over Oftentimes, when we cast a vision, we, we are excited, we're leaders, we run out front, and we don't realize that people are sometimes having a difficulty keeping up because they can't see themselves in that new future. They don't see their role. They don't see their past resonating with them. They're not sure where they fit. Help them see their future. Make it relevant to me. That's a lot of conversations. That's a lot of time, but it's also a lot of potential momentum. And they will be the biggest defenders of that move, of that change, of that vision that you could ever ask for. She wanted to lead the parade, right? Because she knew that the stained glass window was coming and she was excited to go worship in the new space with faith. So help them see their future. Questions on being concrete. Finally, be compelling. When, uh, when Mike Slaughter talked to us about vision casting, and he talked about compelling, he had tears in his eyes. That's how much the vision had moved him. And I still remember that. Here I am, what, 10 years later? Eight years later? Somewhere in there. Something like that. Like, he was so moved by the vision. And I still remember that. Because it moved his heart, and that moved my heart. If we can move the hearts of people, even just an inch, if we can crack through that frozen chosen that we so often are, yeah. right? We can compel people and we can get them excited about it, excited about doing what we want them to do because they want to do it, mm. right? That's leadership. I believe that's Eisenhower. <laughs> the vision must, must be emotionally compelling. We need to help everyone own the problem. To make it compelling for people, people don't always see the problem. Uh, Andy Stanley, one, one presentation, was talking about uh, a new bridge that they needed in their church. Now you may be thinking, you know, this is, this is such a large church, Who, how could this possibly be relevant to us? And, and yet it's very relevant to us. Uh, in fact, it's very relevant to me here at Trinity. 
um, they had a parking problem, right? They had this small bridge that allowed people on and off of their main campus, and when that bridge was full or busy, you were not getting in. Now, if you come to the first service, you got a parking space, you're not fighting the bridge to get onto campus, it's all good. If you come to second service, you can't find parking, you can't get across the bridge, and it's a disaster. First service people didn't know there was a problem. <coughs> Second service people will tell you all day about the problem, right? First service people didn't know there was a problem. Second service people will tell you all day that there is a huge problem. Right here at this space, did, how many people took the shuttle today? Okay, about half of you. Uh, thank you, first of all, for taking the shuttle. Did you see our parking lot? That's all we got for three to four hundred on a Sunday. First service doesn't know there's a problem. <laughs> the handicapped people that come to second or third service, they are hating life. Right? We don't realize these things depending on our context. Help everyone own the problem. Tell them about the problems that they don't see. Tell them about the issue that's happening in children's ministry, even though they don't have kids, and help them understand why it's a big deal. Why should I care about safe sanctuaries? Uh, we were all safe back in the day, and the world's not that bad. <laughs> have mercy. <laughs> help them own the problem. And then speak to their values, right? There's some values, when, when you read your congregation, when you read the people that you know throughout the congregation, you know their stories, uh, you know who has family. Uh, this past Sunday was a great example. You know the people in your congregation who would leave your church if you did not celebrate more of it, right? You know the values that are there because they had family who fought and died and that is more sacred than Easter to them, right? And that's not blasphemy. That's just being honest, right? You know their values. Speak to their values. Know their story. Help them understand what, how this is going to help them, how this is going to reinforce the values that they have. That's what vision casting is. Again, it comes back to salesmanship and, and being able to relate. <coughs> and getting back to that story, talk about one person whose life is changed. When we talk about a group of people, a group doesn't have a face, mm -hmm. right? All these kids are going to come in, and it's going to be great. No, no, no. Let me tell you about Christian. He's seven years old, and every night he jumps up on his bed with his action Bible because you gave it to him. And he is so excited to read through the scriptures. We get to the end of the book, and we got to start over the very next night. And you made that possible. One person, Christian, a little seven-year-old redhead. When you give people that story, they will move mountains to make your vision happen. Questions about being committed? Before I go on, I've got some more actually on compelling. Yes, I do. Um, and this is kind of where we get into some miscellaneous. So you've got a couple of lines there, but uh, this will be relevant to you. I like to be short, oddly enough. I mean, I preach for a half hour, but uh, normally I like to be short <laughs> and, and get things done once and, and not have to do them again. With vision casting, you got to talk about it over and over, and over, and over again. And about the time that you are sick of talking about it, the first person's just understanding. <laughs> right? Mm. Yep. You are a broken record. You don't play any other tunes but that tune. You gotta make it fresh for yourself, otherwise it will shine through, mm. but you have to talk about it over and over so that people can get it. Um, 
for effective teaching to happen, learning must take place. I remember that as a kid. And we had a group of Boy Scouts. I was teaching that class. And they repeated it over and over with me in the class. And at the end of an hour, they could repeat that back to me. Right? Over and over. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Um, give people time to process. Uh, we kind of went into this. But uh, when you give people time to process, you will also get amazing insights that you never expected. So another project that I was working on uh, for the coffee house, we had this really cool space. It was coffee house in the front, worship space in the back. And uh, we were doing the vision project for it. We had made a plan. We had made a booklet. We gave people time to process it. And there was this one family who was kind of not sure where they sat on all of it, not sure that they could endorse it or they were against it or what, what they wanted to do. And I sat with them because I knew they were key players in the game. Like, I needed them to be on board. And uh, we had a conversation at their house. I still remember sitting in their living room. And uh, Bill's looking at the floor plans. And, you know, Jason, I just, I don't see how the noise out here isn't going to travel back there and, and vice versa. It's going to be a mess. Couldn't we just put a wall? Bill, we want a wide open space. Like a wall sends the wrong message, don't you think? Well, it doesn't have to be a, a wall you can't see through. I could have shut that down there, right? You're ridiculous. <coughs> Tell me more, Bill. What are you thinking? You, you got an idea here. Well, what if we built a glass wall? And what if it was like in a, in a museum and it had sliders and, and it could open and close and, and then it's soundproof, but you still see through it? Sure. Drew it right on the plan. Right there? Yeah. Done. That's it. He was on board. His family was on board, wound up with a couple thousand dollars to pay for the glass wall. <laughs> Are you open to input in your vision? Are you open to the opportunity for people to provide feedback? He needed to sit with it. He needed to see it. He needed to process it and digest it. But did we allow the space, did we allow the time for him to do that, and then the opportunity for him to give feedback? That is so important. And sometimes we don't want to do that because we're scared, right, that the people are going to shoot it down. How many of you have had a listening session go south in your church? Right? They're going to sound quick. Yes, sir. What's a listening session? What's a good question, Paul? A listening session, and I don't know, maybe this is a PA thing. Um, it's the idea where you get your congregation together and you've got a hot topic or something that you need to talk about. And so you allow people to give their input. Almost like a town hall. Like a town hall meeting. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, we shy away from these things because we're worried that so-and-so is going to show up and they're going <laughs> to steal the whole conversation. And they're going to lead it south. Did you pray about it? Do you love that person? Mm -hmm. Can you steer them off at the corner? Can you go to them ahead of time and say, hey, I know your concerns. Talk to me some more about them. I've heard a little bit, right? Francis Asbury, uh, most of you I'm sure know Francis Asbury, uh, the true founder of Methodism, in my opinion. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I know. Francis Asbury did not like walking into annual conference not knowing exactly what was going to happen on the floor of conference. In fact, he is often remarked and noted in his journals and noted in other people's journals that he would stay at people's houses the night before. He would meet with key leaders, key delegates, and he would have conversations late into the evening to talk about the issue before they ever showed up at conference. So that by the time they had a business meeting and it was in front of everybody where he knew he was not a good leader, he knew that he had no power and influence to persuade, he already knew how it was going to go because he had had the conversation ahead of time, right? Can we have some of those hard conversations ahead of time with people before we have the essential town hall meetings, right? Oftentimes people just want to be heard. Sometimes they want to steal the show. But then you invite amazing people like Joe here, who was my church council chair for a while, and you say, hey, Joe, could, 
could you help me lead this meeting? And he does an amazing job at it, right? So I allow the space for people to, to give the inside input and don't be scared. You know, perfect love casts out all fear. I believe that somewhere I read it. Sure. Questions about being compelling before we go to do's and don'ts. Yes, sir. This I think goes back. Uh, so, so we're in the process when you give folks time to, to process. It, it sounds like it's pretty deep in, in, in the, the delivery process. Sure. Sure. Um, well, you need to understand your timeline, right? Uh, different visions will have different timelines. Uh, if it's a full-out vision for your church, your timeline's probably no less than a year, right? And so your leadership starts processing through it. They take maybe three to six months. Um, and then you're going to roll it out to the congregation, and, and they might have uh, a month or so to, to kind of process it and digest it. And if you give them too much time, they're going to forget about it, and they're going to take it for granted. Uh, but between two, three, four weeks, that that should be enough space for them to really start the wheels and start to provide some good questions. And again, context, you're going to have to address whatever comes up appropriately. Does that help? Yeah, I think so. One of the things I'm, I'm again, thinking about the context I'm in, um, the, the way we've been talking about vision so far is really about specific projects, um, which Trying to imagine how you how you uh, work this how, how this falls out um, when the the vision that you have is that basically one of those reinventing the DNA of a congregation kind of mm. things. Okay. Um, and so I, I mean I get I get where the pieces I think I, I'm beginning to get where the pieces are. Um, just, and, and maybe the trouble is I don't have that clarified in my head enough to really start talking about it. It could be. Um, without knowing your particulars and exactly what you're talking about, it sounds like you're talking about a whole new vision for the congregation. We're not just talking about one project. Right. We're talking about every project, right? Right. And you're talking about a new discipleship plan? Yes. And you're talking about worship and everything else kind of is on the chopping block, right? Yeah, pretty much. Stay for the second course. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it was. <laughs> okay, great. Tom? I, I was just going to say, you know, I think it depends on the size of the project. Right? You're talking a big thing. And down in the Carlisle United Methodist, which was a merger of three churches, uh, when they decided to merge, that was in March of 12. And just two months ago, they approved the building program and the finances for that. So it took six years to get to that point, and they're still not in the building. <laughs> well, but I think the size. And Tom, of the prior building, to March of twelve, you had been working on that project for how many years? Well, um, it was it was about a year about a year for the three churches, but at Allison, we were working on it for four years because we were looking to relocate and it was the decision for one church to relocate that became the catalyst for the discussion of the merger mm -hmm. and then that was another year with outside counsel we brought in a, an outside consultant to work with us yeah um, again depends on your context your size your need uh, for yours, it sounds like similar to uh, what Kay Kutan has right. led in the past with Healthy Church Initiative, right. uh, the vital, te vital teams that uh, we have working. In, in a situation like that, discipleship plan and all, you're about a year total, right? From the time that you start until the time that you, you feel like you've got a lot of traction and you're doing some implementation. Um, your startup prep is gonna be three months, maybe, uh, where you're working with some key leaders. And then you've got some focused three months where you're starting to involve a lot more of the congregation and roll some things out. And then you've got a focused six months, uh, six to nine, depending on how big it is, uh, where you're really starting to implement some of the changes 
uh, and do things. So it can be 12 to 18 months overall. If this is inappropriate for this conversation, um, that's okay. Um, it, it's basically the context is they did a Matthew 28 consultation. Mm -hmm. We're still working into living into that on the second pastor. Mm. Um, so trying to trying to How get. How long ago was the 28th? Uh, four, five years. Uh, <laughs> it's time to redo. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a vision. If we're talking about a vision for a church, three to five years tops. Tops. Uh, because your context is going to change. Now, some of your contexts won't, right? Some of you are in the same community that they looked like in 1850. Like, God bless you. Um, but, but I know here for Hummelstown, uh, which we're 225 years old, a little over that, uh, the past 10 years, the demographics and dynamics of this town has so massively shifted thanks to the Med Center, right? They have quadrupled in size. They've got residents, they've got staff, they've got a cancer wing, they've got this, they got that. They're huge. And it bleeds out into us. And it changes who we are and who we're serving and how we do that. So three to five years, it's it's gotta change and it's gotta shift. So yeah, it, it sounds like it's time. You know, with, with visioning as well, you know, I think we, we can't underscore that, you know, as leaders that you have to prepare your family as well because and you have to prepare yourself and your family because it takes a lot of time and it's not you know i know you said that you know there's there's good and this and that there is good in the long term but it takes a lot out of you as a leader and it takes Absolutely. a lot out of your family because you're devoting a lot of time to your congregation so for me it was a process of preparing my wife and children along the way to make sure that i kept healthy you know, in that aspect. Uh, because it is, it's very taskful. Uh, you know, if God leads you, certainly he'll give you the strength, but it doesn't mean that, you know, you got to keep everybody involved. You're, you are absolutely 100% right, and that's a huge oversight in this presentation. Um, yeah, your spouse is a rock. Um, our house would fall apart. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would just add, Working with your vision, you got to really bring your leadership on board. Because I know when when I came here six years ago, I was only here three years. We had some drove we had some real tough decisions to make: uh, reconfiguring staff, laying some staff off, and so forth. And uh, those were tough, but the leadership was on board with it. And you can't do it by yourself. You've got to have uh, the leadership. I remember telling the staff, Parrish, you know, I'll, I'll be the point for this, but my head will not be the only one on the block. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they stood by it. They stood by it and did, made some real tough decisions, didn't we, John? Mm -hmm. Made some real tough decisions. Let me give you a couple of do's and don'ts, because I think this might address some of the things that we're talking about here. Um, th this was kind of the miss- Yes, sir? A question. It's kind of a little off topic. Did you write all this? Yeah. <laughs> Are you amazed that my handwriting's this good or bad? I'm, I'm actually amazed. Oh, <laughs> thanks, Paul. <laughs> um, some do's and don'ts. As I think it's kind of been implied. Yeah. Don't quit. You need to be the cheerleader, uh, especially if you are the one taking the lead, you are the one driving the vision, you are the one pushing the idea. Uh, it is pushing a boulder up a hill, on top of a hill. Um, don't quit, don't get discouraged, don't give up, keep pushing. You got this far, it's just a little further. Next step, next step, next step, like eating an elephant. Um, sometimes the answer will be no, right? More often than not, the answer is not quite now, not right now, or most common, I just don't see it, right? You can't quit, they just don't see it. They, it once they see it, you'll gain momentum. It's like a flywheel, 
If you're familiar with good to, good to great and the flywheel process, once you crank it enough, it'll take itself all the way. Okay? This one's the most important to me. Don't compromise, compromise your integrity. It is tempting, it is so tempting to take the easy way out on a vision sometimes, to um, not give all the answers, to give people the answers they want to hear but you never intend to actually do, uh, to leave some people out because it's just going to be so much easier if I don't deal with them, right? <laughs> There are a hundred different ways that you can slice this, and you would compromise yourself every time. But I believe if we are faithful in little, we can be trusted with much. Don't compromise even the little decisions. Because when the big ones are out there, people are going to notice, it's going to get around, and you're going to be doomed. Right? Don't shoot yourself in the foot. To your point earlier, Tom, Raise up a Timothy, or a whole community of them. Have somebody on your side, in your corner, a team of people working with you. Somebody who's going to be there and, and field the frustrating phone calls. Somebody uh, that is going to be able to bounce ideas off of you. Somebody that's going to be able to do it next time, right? So that you are not the one that has to do it all the time. Uh, to plant leaders within the congregation and, and replicate yourself. Raise up a Timothy, Paul and Timothy relationship uh, of the next generation of leaders that are going to be in your church. That may even be your pastor, your lay person. I'm just curious, how many lay people? Okay. It's okay, lead up. Nothing wrong with that. We need direction sometimes. This one's for specifically the pastors, but lay people as well. Um, Mike Slaughter had two points of advice for us uh, when he met with us as young pastors. He said, first of all, use your nominations committee. You, as the pastor, are the chair of nominations. And when you arrive, if your church has crummy leadership, it's not your fault. But after three years, if your church has current leadership, <laughs> it's your fault, right? You are the chair of nominations. Use it. Second thing that he told us, pastors, you have a master's degree. Use it. You proved that you have a brain at one point. Use that brain. Figure out the solution, he said. Mike is a take-no-excuses kind of guy. <laughs> um, his staff does not take excuses or make excuses. They work on a budget, and they almost never have more than three weeks of expenses in the bank on an $11 million annual budget. They only keep three weeks of expenses on hand. Jeez. That's terrifying. But he turns to his staff all the time, and he says, figure it out. You are smart people. Brothers and sisters, not only are you smart, we are gifted. We have the gift of the Holy Spirit, right? God says something about he's going to bless us, comfort us, and guide us. I remember that somewhere, right? So you got it. Use it. Then take time to dream. Do take time to dream. The absolute worst thing, absolute worst thing that you could ever experience is having a conversation with a person in your congregation who wants to give you $100,000 and you have no idea what you want to do. Because guess what? That $100,000 is going to go someplace else. Right? Take the time to dream. And this is hard. Because if you're a pastor, and even if you are a lay leader of some sort, you're busy. You're very busy. Week in, week out, kids, meetings, craziness. Take the time at very least once a year to get away, to go on a spiritual retreat, 
to be in time with prayer and to dream, you know? Um, bad example. The Godfather? Yes, sir. <laughs> Familiar with the Godfather movies? Yes, sir. <laughs> and Corleone sits out there in his chair looking out at the lake and everything. He's sitting there visioning. He's got a vision for his empire. He is dreaming. But we're too busy to do that, right? Mm -hmm. If we don't take the time to dream, we're not taking the time to pray, we're not taking the time to allow God to speak and God to speak through us. Take the time to dream. And the last part there, know your givers. Money follows vision. Once you have your dream, once you have your vision, know who's going to support it. And it is very noble to say, oh, well, you know, I, I don't want to show partiality uh, to people if I know they're giving and I know who can support it. Uh, I've heard it from Lovett Weems. I have heard it from Cliff Christopher. Uh, I have heard it from Adam Hamilton and Mike Slaughter. Uh, I've heard it from a lot of different leaders. That is a line of bull, they would say. What else, not, what else would it help you if you didn't know about your congregation? Right? Well, what else would you like not to know about that to be a better pastor or a better leader? Right? Yes, sir. Ma'am. Yeah. And I, I think it limits us, though, if we think of givers as just connected to the dollar sign because there's the time and the talents as well. So if you're thinking about that, I think that you can kind of get around that financial sense of know your givers as far as those people that, can, that will spend the extra time and that have a dream with you. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're absolutely right. And, and that's, that's kind of what I mean with raise up a Timothy. When you know your spiritually gifted people and, and you know the people who, who are going to come alongside and help, sometimes we overlook people. Definitely. And you don't always know what their financial status is. They may live very frugally and then leave you $500,000. Mm -hmm. It has amazed me. Farmers. When I was in college and found out that farmers are the wealthiest people in central PA, I was like, what? <coughs> but they wear overalls and step and <laughs> And they pay cash for everything. We take it for granted because we don't know the people. And they're very generous, too, generally. Sir? Yeah, I was just thinking about you know the presentation. Um, and some visions are much more compelling than others naturally. Mm -hmm. You know, you can think of a worship space being, being a very compelling thing, a children's wing, a, you know, youth, a new youth building or something like that. And then I think about like, what about what about things like, it's more than just a building like, oh, we need a new roof. That's not quite a vision, right? Not even a vision. But what about something that's just as functional? Like, oh, we need a new church kitchen. Where, is, is that, is that like, or hey, we need new offices, so we need to add onto our church and build a new office space. Is that, how would you draw, would you be able to draw a line in the sand as far as where is something that you put before the church as a vision about a preferred future, or what's something that just sticks with the trustees and the finance and just figure out a paperwork? That, that's a really great question. Um, I think the question you need to stop and ask is, is it a vision? Um, you know, a kitchen in and of itself is not a vision. It's a project. But a soup kitchen, a Sunday morning breakfast for people in the community, <coughs> uh, Wednesday night meals for students who are coming to youth group. That is a vision. And that is compelling and that is moving. And you need a kitchen for that vision to take place. Mm. Exactly. Your roof, not nearly as sexy. But <laughs> <laughs> still, <laughs> debt, debt is the worst. Oh. It is the worst. It, it is the millstone around the neck of a poorly executed vision, right? Uh, that's what debt is. Uh, unfortunately, there is no way that you can get through that other than to trudge and to trudge well and to, to cast the vision of being free of what could we do if we did not have this. Um, a roof. Talk about what happens in the space. What does the space make possible because you are under roof, because there's not leaks in the corners? Mm -hmm. uh, my first appointment was to Stevens Memorial, uh, Stevens Emanuel, uh, in Allison Hill. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. we had on the second floor, we had a children's ministry, uh, Center for Champions, and they had a hole 
in the roof. I, no lie, it was this big. Oh, it was straight through. You could see daylight. Like, I have no idea how they did not get shut down. I still, I was only there six months. I still have no idea how they happened. Yeah. How do you, how do you preach that? I, we we talk about the safety of kids. We talk about the single stories of the kids who are there after school because we don't want them on the street. And you know what, brothers and sisters, we need to provide a safe place for them because they don't have it out there, but they do have it in here. So let's make sure that it's safe for them. Um, you, you talk about what is possible in the space. The vision is not the project. The project is a component of the vision. That's interesting. So in developing a vision, which could be a whole other talk, sure. um, in your own experience, have you found it starting as a project that became a vision, or it started as a dream or a vision and then was, was, was um, um, broken down into projects? I think it depends on the circumstances. No, it depends on what it wells up inside of you, right? Yeah. Uh, so right now, we are our trustees are looking at a new roof for this wing, right? It's great vision. The great vision. Yeah, great vision. <laughs> How much you need? Great vision. <laughs> but when we cast a vision for it, we're going to have to talk about the Wednesday morning Bible study that happens here before elementary school. We're going to have to talk about the Thursday afternoon Promised Land, which is like a mini vacation Bible school for kids after school every Thursday. We're going to talk about the small groups that meet in these spaces. We're going to talk about what happens in this education way because we know that that project needs done. Mm -hmm. So we're going to see the vision which justifies the project. Uh, with the worship space, when I came on board, I had a very personal and clear vision of what I wanted worship to be mm -hmm. and what I believed, what I had heard from the congregation what I believed we wanted worship to be, be all three. And so the project then was the necessary next step that would allow that to happen. So it, it depends on the context. Sure, thanks. My question is, how do we, what is the process by which how we focus? So do we have a beginning group that we deal with, like the, the, the SPRC trustees? How do we navigate through the different entities till we get to the full body? Again, it depends on project and context. Um, some churches are going to have lots of bodies, right? Lots of committees. Uh, our church, we recently, a couple of years ago, narrowed down that we have one administrative board, and then we have uh, trustees who care for the building, right? So if there's a building need, for instance, the roof project, that's starting with trustees. They're saying, hey, this is a priority. we got to get it on the list. And they go to council. Because they're saying, hey, we got money we need to spend, and it's a lot of it. Uh, and then council and the pastor will talk and kind of come up with a plan. And incidentally, because of where we are in the life of the church, we are creating a new vision for our future. And we have a separate team that has been open to everyone in the congregation who is that visioning team. They're working closely with council. So... So it depends on, on the project, it depends on the context. You know. And in some small churches, it's, it might be the same 10 people on all of these teams. Mm -hmm. you know. yeah. But make sure they're the right 10 people. That's right. Don't just take the warm bodies that have always been there. Because mm -hmm. after three years, it's your fault. <laughs> Working on a vision right now? Yes? What are you doing, Chris? We're looking at remodeling and or expanding. Now, our children are in a closet. Your children are in a closet, you should let them out. Correct. <laughs> 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 right. so, so, so they are there. So we, we are looking at a, a remodeling and or adding order, just beginning that process. Where, so just beginning like you're only a month in? Uh, we are uh, working, having some contractors begin to lay out some plans for us. And so nice. I have a photo on my phone that I show people of uh, 18 children in the closet, um, and none of them in the back can get out. <laughs> so, so yeah, so we, we are looking at that, and we are out of space, classroom space. Um, 
this space right here is larger than any classroom space that we have in our building. And like all of it together, like smaller than here. And, and Jim knows that. So, so, so that is, uh, I've been talking about that for years. Wow. But I had to wait till I used my nominations to have the right leaders. So. Huh. That's what we're doing. Cool. Cool. Got a picture, got an elevator talk. That was 30 seconds. Nice. I listened. <laughs> <laughs> you had a <laughs> Anybody else got a vision you're working? We're working on the minimum accountable structure. The simplified accountable structure. Yes. The simplified, the simplified accountable, accountable structure. structure. So going from many teams to one team. Where there's a minimum of going to accountability. Right. But hopefully going to simplify as well. Yes. Because we've got 22 ministries, we worship 85 people. Oh, great. This makes no Whoa. sense. Four people per team, and that's if there's 100% participation. <laughs> gotcha. Good. So you've identified the problem, potential solution. Why do I care? Why do you care? Mm -hmm. Because we can do more ministry, we can be more effective in making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. We can serve our community, we can serve God. Nice. Nice. Cut some red tape. Yeah. Streamline. Red tape, great watchword. Bureaucracy. Uh, yeah. Everybody wants to eliminate those things. Anybody else? Nobody wants to talk now. You're like, oh, he's going to put me on the spot. 